Well, good morning, everyone. What a great crowd. Welcome to uh, the Columbus Chamber's CEO Insight Series. I'm Michael Dalby. I'm the president and CEO of the Chamber, and it is great to have Jane and all the rest of the Donato's crew here today. Uh, we're looking forward to this. This is our sixth installment of our CEO Insights. Uh, we know we have uh, some familiar faces in the crowd, people that have been with us probably on every single one of them, uh, but we know we've got some new faces too. So. Uh, Hope you uh, enjoy this experience. This is kind of a fun thing for us to do in kind of an intimate setting, to be kind of up close and personal and have this opportunity. So thanks to you all. Thanks to all of you for being here. As you enjoy the program today, uh, remember that you can also engage in the conversation on Twitter. We'll be using the hashtag CCCEOinsights. And if this is one of your first opportunities to really kind of get to know the chamber, uh, let me take a moment and share a little about us because maybe some things you know about chambers of commerce, we're a little different than that. Um, we changed some things up about three years ago to uh, become a very responsive chamber to our members and to be a, uh, a leader in the business community. We want to make sure that there's two key elements that we're doing every day. Number one, be the voice of business to, uh, to government. We want to make sure that we are we are addressing the concerns, the policy issues that are most important to business and being uh, proactive and engaging at the local, the state, and the federal level on those issues. In fact, right now, our, uh, today, this morning, our uh, government relations team is mostly uh, at the state house. We're working on a bill called uh, Municipal Income Tax Uniformity, uh, which if you, uh, if you file income tax in multiple communities, yes, yeah, see, I see a few people clapping here. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a big issue, so it's one that we've been engaging on for the last two years, and hopefully we're going to push this across the goal line. The other area that we work in is business services. We want to provide very tangible support services to businesses so to help them get to the next level. I mean, essentially, the mission of the chamber is to help businesses thrive. Pretty simple. We believe if we have businesses that are thriving, then it creates a thriving economy, creates a great place to live, work, and do business. So that's, that's what we're all about. Those business services are things like uh, helping businesses with talent advisement. You know, this is something, a big issue these days with trying to find the talent that you need to be able to run your business to be able to get to that next level. Uh, help out with business market research. This is a fun part of our operation. We do research for individual businesses, help them come up with everything from like a targeted uh, prospect list to, uh, to doing wage and benefit surveys, to doing things that some of our smaller and mid-sized companies just wouldn't have the resources to be able to do. And we also uh, generally make connections. I mean, when you think about it, that's really what this is all about, is helping businesses make connections, do those things, help them get to the sale, help them to be able to, to uh, get to that next level. I mean, we feel like if we provide these kind of services, then that's what we're going to be able to do to help our community be great, period. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. So uh, again, thank you all for being here. We couldn't do those services if we didn't have a lot of sponsors and event partners and to help us out on, uh, on events like today. So we're grateful for support from our presenting partners, which are Commerce and National Bank and Columbus CEO, as well as the Chamber Signature Partners, which are Anthem, CareWorks, CareWorks Consultants, Inc., and the City of Columbus. Our leader partner is State Auto, and we have several in-kind partners, including our friends at Dawson, who are providing the venue once again and hosting us today. Let's give them a round of applause. Now, to help us get to know our featured guests, I'd like to introduce Ms. Gren Jennifer Griffith, President of Commerce National Bank. Jennifer? Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Great. Fantastic. Now, if everyone closes their eyes, I'm curious, can you visualize what Ms. Abel Grody looks like? <laughs> Anyone? Jane? is um, memorable because she's fantastic, because she invites us in to share her passion. She invites us in to participate in the love of great pizza, and she wants to connect with our community at all times. And so you see her in your neighborhoods. You can probably feel the charisma when the driver shows up in your driveway. At Commerce, a couple of years ago, our team decided that we had to start measuring diversity. And that meant we had to measure human resources, and we had to measure our board, and we had to measure our customers, and we had to measure our vendors. So 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, Mr. McAuliffe said, you know what, we're going to buy lunch for our employees twice a month, every month, forever. We said, okay, well, that counts as a vendor. We're only buying 
from ones that measure. And at that point, we swore off all pizza, except Donato's. And about six times a year, we bring in 20 pizzas for our staff of 18 to eat. <laughs> On Friday, after Thanksgiving, I swear there were five bank cars in our parking lot. Anyone else work the Friday after Thanksgiving? I did. Any bankers, Martin? Maybe. Maybe. All right, so we had five bank cars, and I go down at lunch. There, I'm not kidding you, a dozen pizzas on a Friday after Thanksgiving, sitting down there waiting. To, we're passing them out like free bread. Um, Jane matters to our community, and Donato's matters to our community. And um, thank you so much for sharing the morning. With that, I'd really like to welcome Kristen Hartman and Ms. Jane Abel Grody. Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another CEO Insights. I couldn't be more delighted to be here speaking with you, Jane Grody Abel. And I love the fact that we're having pizza for breakfast. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's just get right down to it. And actually, I do have one reminder for all of you. You guys got note cards, right? No cards for questions. So if you can fill those out with a question, and then we'll collect them right around 8.40-ish, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So now that we've gotten our, our, our homework done, let's get right down to business. Um, I love the fact that you came up in the family business. And pizza was literally in your living room, in your kitchen, in your, and, 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 and people came to where you lived to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, you know, a lot of people, when they, they come up in a family business, they go and, and, and venture off and to do something else. You stayed. Why? Wow. Um, well, just to give you a little background to that. <laughs> hey, Dad. Um, <laughs> hey, Dad. It's always fun to have your dad in the audience, too. Um, we did. We grew up right behind the very first store on Thurman Avenue in the south side of Columbus. And, you know, my memories of that, which I thought were very normal, turns out they're not, but um, my dad, when he envisioned this black brick building on Thurman Avenue, he didn't build a dining room. Don't know why. And so our living room literally became the dining room for our customers. And at <laughs> night, Literally, because dad would, they'd come in to get the pizza, and dad said, go back and see Nancy and the kids, and, and they did. And I, I applaud my mom, because she always opened the door. <laughs> she, she just kept that door shut, but she always opened the door, and her living room was full of people. And you know the energy, if you've ever worked in a restaurant or where you work now, there's an energy and an excitement in a restaurant business that um, there's buzz, and it's contagious, and uh, you can feel it. And that's what we felt every single night in our, in our living room. And sometimes in the morning we felt it, too, because they were still there. I don't know why. <laughs> but people were always in our house. <laughs> don't know what that was about. But, um, and then, you know, at nighttime, Dad would get us kids out of bed and in our pajamas. And we'd go out and stand under the sign that had those big blinking lights. Mm -hmm. And I remember being a little girl standing under that sign and just hearing my dad say, one day, we're going to be around the world. And he never said, because we're going to be the biggest, or we're going to make the, the most money. Or it was always about bringing our principals to work with us and being able to provide a place on every block where we could make a difference. And that stuck with me. Mm -hmm. um, so from the energy and the excitement of being around the customers and the associates in the store, that just stuck with me. And so um, for me, I knew, I, I knew then I wanted to be in the business. I don't know exact. I had no mm -hmm. idea I'd be sitting here. Um, but I knew I wanted to be in the business because of the energy and the, just the values that our business provides. So it bit you early. Pardon? It bit you early. Oh, the yeah. bug bit you bit early. early yeah. What was the most important thing your dad taught you? Oh, there's so much. Um, I would say two things. One is the power of positive thinking and um, what you believe in the story that you tell yourself, you can create your own reality. So if it's negative thinking and you are thinking negatively, um, then you attract that. If it's the positive thinking and you surround yourself with people that are positive and with positive energy, then you attract that. And that what you visualize, you can obtain. Um, taught from a very early age because mm -hmm. he read 
Power of Positive Thinking, Think and Grow Rich, which are all great books. But it was really instilled in our entire family, whether it was developing the Peppomatic, whether it was building the business, whether it was buying back the business, um, all those <laughs> all those things that you set out forth, and then obviously the persistence to work towards it um, was a really critical one. And the other one is to love your way through it. And no matter what life brings at you, um, to love your way through it. And that uh, has taught me so many valuable lessons in life, whether you know we had a delivery driver that was robbed or whether in my own personal life I had things going on, it was learning to love your way through it. Okay, um, and that kind of, uh, you guys have kind of four principles that you think should exist at work. It's the fun, it, and what else? So work should be fun. Yeah. Work, you should learn something, but what else? So we, there are philosophy, and it's to live, love, laugh, and learn, and live life to its fullest, because it's short, and you know, we are all faced with lots of things every single day, and so it's live life to its fullest, and that, and that is, taking care of yourself, taking care of your family, taking care of those around you, um, doing things because it's the right thing to do, mm -hmm. and just living life and enjoying it. Um, and what for me, that's travel. I love to travel. Mm -hmm. um, I love to go watch Tom Krause, my fiance, um, <laughs> play Grass and Nine. And so live life to its fullest. It's also about laughing and learning to laugh at yourself. And I have to laugh at myself all the time, but learning to laugh at yourself. And, you know, I think we got to a certain point in business where um, we're serving other people, and that's pretty serious. We literally are serving others, mm -hmm. but it's pizza. And we should have fun with it, right? It's, yeah. it's about having fun. And laughter, I think, um, brings health, healthfulness. Mm -hmm. And um, it, people enjoy being around people that laugh. So learning to laugh and... Um, to live, love, learn. Oh, this has been a huge one. Curiosity, I think, is just such a, an incredible trait for anyone, for a leader. But having the curiosity to learn and to always make sure that any situation, no matter who you're talking to, that you're learning from the individual and that you're taking something away from it. Um, How do you incorporate all of those things? You know, because a lot of people say, well, I have my my work life and my home life, um, but the way you describe it, those principles from your, you know, the, the things that you enjoy from your home life should bleed a little into your, your work life. How do you do that? How do you, how do you make work fun? How do you make it a learning experience? How do, you, how do you do that? How do you make that part of the environment? Well, as you know, growing up in a family business, I'm not sure there's ever a, a scene where you say, okay, I'm at work <laughs> and I'm at home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which has been a big lesson for me. I, I had to learn that one. But I think the mm -hmm. most important thing is that you learn to be who you are at work mm -hmm. and allow yourself to be yourself at work and allow yourself to be yourself at home. And um, I got to a point during the McDonald's days when I remember I was driving to work and it wasn't fun anymore. Um, lots of reasons mm -hmm. why. But I remember pulling up in the car and feeling like I had to put armor on to go into work and feeling okay. like, I remember I'd taken a deep breath like, okay, this is who I have to be when I go into work today. And it was a completely different environment than anything I ever experienced. Um, so for me, that lesson was, I hope everybody at Donato's um, is able to come to work and be who they are. Mm -hmm. And I hope no one ever has to pull up and take that deep breath and be like, okay, this is who I have to be. We can just be who we are every single day. So that balance then, who you are at home and who you are at work, there shouldn't, there shouldn't be anything different. It should just be who you are every day. All right. I, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, you have alluded to it a couple of times already in the interview, the, the McDonald's purchase and where Donato's has been and where it's gone and where it's going. So let's talk a little bit about that because Donato's uh, came up in Columbus and, and then you had that knock on the door that every business owner would like to get that acquisition. Um, tell us a little bit about that. What was that like? It was crazy. Yeah. Um, it was great and it was crazy. So, and oh gosh, it was 1999. We had about 145 restaurants and we were already franchising. We were in five states um, and we weren't, we weren't necessarily looking to sell 
at all, but we were looking to grow. So we were exploring doing an IPO, and Chuck Kegler, who's sitting here in the audience, and Jim Weiland, and our, our group of advisors, my brother, talking about how do we grow the business? When you're yeah. a private business, how do you grow? Because growth is good. Growth is healthy. It's good for the people. It's good for the community. It's good for, the, for um, economics. So it's important that we grow. So how do you do that and do it in a way that you can keep your culture and your soul and your spirit alive? So we were exploring all those things. And, and at the same time, actually, we were having conversations with Wendy's about co-branding or doing something differently. And McDonald's knocks on our door and flies to Chicago. And then you know, we're, my brother and my dad and I are sitting around the table with Jack Greenberg at the time. And I'm young and, you know, ah, what is all this? And um, so he throws, Jack Greenberg throws out that they want to buy the whole business. And uh, my brother, who's a visionary at the time, was our COO, was just like, yes. And I almost, uh, truthfully, started to cry. I'm oh like, boy. we would never do that. It's your family. It's our family, family business. Thing, yeah. So, mm -hmm. and my dad just sat there. <laughs> so, and so <laughs> I was like, Whoa. So we came back. It did. It took us about three months, and we had great strategic conversations. But the truth is, McDonald's is this great company. It's the world's largest restaurant company. And they have so much to offer, whether it's training or their, their university, their drive through their real estate, their uh, intellectual capital. Mm -hmm. And so obviously, there were so many pros. And the, the one con um, that, that came up really is our culture. And how do you merge the world's largest restaurant company and allow them to, to acquire your company as a family business and not lose your culture? And so that really became our main drive, like how do we keep our soul, how do we keep our spirit alive um, while we're being acquired by McDonald's? So we did decide to sell for all the right reasons, um, for growth, opportunity for our people, for the community, um, and it was a long four years. Um, and then we bought it back. And so I think during those times of McDonald's, for me personally, um, I learned a lot during that time. I learned about um, really keeping my voice. And I lost my voice during that time. And I, I narrow it down now to the four C's, but um, courage for me during that time was really difficult. And so when I say I lost my voice, I started working in an environment that was very different than what I was used to. I was always used to going to my dad's office and saying, hey, uh, I disagree with this. I was our chief mm -hmm. people officer at the time, and um, it was all about culture, and culture can be defined in many ways, but it's really about your family. It's just like family. So yeah. you have births, you have divorces, you have marriages, and your family grows, but there's a soul about your family that's different from anybody else's. So how, did, how are we going to keep that? All of a sudden, McDonald's comes along, and there's 28 new vice presidents, and there's a new CEO. And I just would go in his office and say, hey, I disagree with that, or I, I don't understand. That's not what we would do here. And um, I always say, honestly, if he could have patted me on the head and said, go away, little girl, I think he would have done that. But <laughs> he just would look at me like, oh, you're driving me crazy. And then all of a sudden, I. I don't want to say I got it, but I started working differently. Mm -hmm. And I started working for, not for the mission of our company. I started working, honestly, um, for me and in a very vulnerable statement. It became much more about me and much more about my position in the company and much more about my, what my resume was going to look like and this new environment. And I, I would do things that I never even thought about doing before, like watch someone walk in the CEO's office and I'd be like, oh. Wonder what they're wonder if they're trying to take training away from me, like all those negative thoughts, then like I own training or something. <laughs> so it was like <laughs> it was a strange it was a really strange yeah. nine months for me of working in that type. I call it fear, but really um, anxiety, and that's when I lost my soul. I lost the courage to speak up. I lost the courage to bring my character to work with me. I lost the courage to fight for our culture in the way that I thought I needed to. Um, and that was, a, that was a dark time for me, but it was probably the best time for me because I saw, remember waking, I, wasn't, I was working at 3 in the morning over at Easton in our new offices. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what happens, right? So you start working harder and you're paranoid and you become paralyzed and then you start looking around, you're wondering what other people are doing or saying and what their agendas are. Um, and I'd never had that before. 
It was 3 in the morning, and we were getting ready to make a pretty major decision on closing a, a market, which again didn't make sense to me. We were a family business. We always invested in the future, and all of a sudden, we were a public company now, and we had to close a whole market to send a message to the street, and so that was me going in. Like, this doesn't make sense to me. This is a short-term business decision. And so while we're in the midst of that, it was 3 in the morning, and I turned around to my desk, and it was, you ever have those moments when the, like, the lights just come on, and you're like, oh, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. And I read Desiderata, which is a, a poem that my dad had given me way back in high school. And it was like my lights just came on, and I realized what I was doing. I realized when I looked in the mirror then that it was becoming more about me than it was about the mission of the company and uh, changed. It, I it kind of had this awakening, but this aha moment mm -hmm. um, that completely changed the course in which we were then operating. So it was so another how did three you years. But how did you change? I, that's a good question. I think um, the other part of the four C's, so it, uh, it's character. I started having the courage to speak up again. So I always say, like, people, I thought I was a good person, but I made some really dumb mistakes. Um, and you fall into this pattern or this behavior. And character is really important. And sometimes really good people have this really strong character, and you surround yourself with, with people with good character. But sometimes you can go in a really bad place because you don't have the courage to live your character out loud. You don't have the courage to live those values out loud, and I lost that during that time. And so really through a lot of, uh, a lot of quiet time, but uh, really learning how to have that courage to live my character and my values out loud again. Um, and then understanding really how having that courage, not only just to live your character, but to learn and to be vulnerable and to say you don't know the answer and to be okay with that um, and to have the courage to have curiosity. All those things were, were helpful to me. It really changed the course because then my mindset was about what's best for the company, not what was best for me. And we, we did end up closing the market, but we did it with goodwill you know, using the power of positive thinking and a lot of hard work. It was about, at the end of closing that market in Atlanta, we wanted to be written up in the, f in the front page of the business journal, and we wanted it to say that we did it with goodwill. And I'm glad to say that the business journal did write an article, and we did do it with goodwill, and we gave um, everyone a severance package. We helped them find jobs, but it was changing the way in which I was thinking um, that, that I had to do internally mm -hmm. to get to a point of, not working in fear anymore. I have a lot of follow-up questions okay. on that, but I want to I want to keep on the timeline. So, uh, McDonald's came knocking, and then you went knocking back and said, "Hey, wait a minute, we want to buy it back." Yeah. Why? Well, so McDonald's bought Donatos for a meal occasion strategy. So they um, at the time had bought Chipotle. They wanted a pizza category and uh, chicken, which was Boston Market and actually a, a bit of Fazoli. So they, they were really looking for a meal occasion strategy. And in the first year into it, um, we had grown our G&A from 10 million to 28 million. We opened up 75 stores in one year. We opened in Germany. Uh, we were expanding way faster than we were able to develop our people. Um, McDonald's hit a historic all-time low on their stock. And so the rumor hit the street that they were getting out of all the brands. And at the same time, um, the, as soon as the rumor hit, um, I was, uh, my dad came into my office, and our whole family was in the business, and during this time, um, they had all found their passions outside of the business. So dad walked in my office, and he sat down, and I'm like, let's go. we got to buy this company back, Dad. I need you. Oh, we got to buy it back. And, you know, we have 5,000 people out there that are counting on us, wow. and we have a destiny. And there's so much more to Donato's than allowing us to either someone else buy it or close down. Let's buy it back. And you're really smart and you're awesome, Dad. I need you and I really need your money because <laughs> <laughs> I don't have enough money. <laughs> but I'll sell my house. I'll do whatever it takes. And so um, he, he didn't even blink. And we put a great team of people together, um, including Tom Krause, who was with us then, and Chuck Kegler and Jim Weiland, to, to figure out how to buy the company back. And at the same time, though, our CFO, who was hired, was trying to close the company down and sell all the assets. So in October of that year, 2003, we went in front of the brand board at McDonald's, and the CFO is presenting this plan to um, close down Donato's and um, really sell the real estate and get some money back from McDonald's. 
because um, I paid a good price for it in 1999. And then uh, I presented the, our team's plan uh, to buy it back, and McDonald's was a great partner, really, really a great partner with us and letting us um, really get it back for a really good price. Mm -hmm. So that was, for me, uh, the power of positive thinking, another example of just really when you know when you when you see something um, and you can visualize it and then you I, I didn't have any second thoughts it wasn't uh, I wasn't nervous I was never thought what are we doing um, we really there was this momentum in buying the company back and that that was an exciting time mm -hmm. was it kind of going from the gut and just knowing you needed think, to do that I think it was going from uh, really the passion of our people and our gut so you know Meanwhile, it took about nine months to buy the company back. It's like having a baby, but um, <laughs> that's a big. Baby. I can say that, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was a big baby. <laughs> but when I, uh, during that time, we didn't pay retention bonuses for our people to stay. Um, it wasn't about please. It, we weren't doing the please stay, and not that I don't think that's a good or bad thing. It's just we couldn't at that time, and. And I think the people that stayed, stayed because they cared. Imagine, like, rumors are everywhere. The CFO is trying to shut it down. We're trying to buy it back. People are, are worried about their jobs, but they're every single day. Our managers were in the stores fulfilling our promise and serving our pizza and doing everything they could to make our customers happy. And that first year, we were losing money the, the year that we bought it back. Mm -hmm. That first year, th this is how delicate brands are. It's amazing to me we had a ten and a half million dollar turnaround and and you look back and say what did we do what was different mm -hmm. and I really truly believe that our people started caring about what they did again and they didn't care during the McDonald's I don't want to say they didn't care yeah. I don't know that I don't well I don't know that everyone's heart was mm -hmm. in it and that people were doing it because they wanted to serve I think during that time, it became jobs. Like it became a job for me during a period of time. So it became a job and a career for people. And so I think you can lose your identity in that, and you can lose your soul and your passion in that. Sure. And so um, I, th I truly, now it wasn't, I don't think they cared because it was Jim, and I don't think they cared because it was me. I think they just truly started caring about what they did again and knowing that we believed enough in the organization, in our company, and in our, our brand and what we were doing to buy it back. Um, so that that really, truly, the soul of our company came alive and stronger after the buyback. Mm -hmm. And our people, which are amazing, we have people that have still been with us since I was a little girl, have lots of stories on me, um, <laughs> to today, mm -hmm. who just truly, they love serving people. And that's, that's the important, that's what we do as we serve. And, and don't you think that, uh, in, in I've spoken with you in the past, prior to here, and, and you really get this feeling that you care about your employees. Don't you think they felt that too? I think that filters down. I think it does, but I don't think it's just me. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. it's our entire organization, and today it's under the leadership of Tom Krause, who is our CEO, and Tom Prender, who came on board as the COO. It's, it's you know, leaders do lead people but when you allow people to bring their whole self to work and they trust the environment in which they work um, that's what inspires mm -hmm. that that's then they know they really don't care how much you know until they know how much you care but you can only show people how much you care by creating an environment where people trust you know and it is about it is about giving our our phone numbers to our managers to our associates so so that there's no levels and there's no titles and you know we really are here to serve so we're here to serve our people who serve our customers so you got it back and did the mission change if it did change how did it change no our mission never has never changed so mm -hmm. since I was a little girl our mission is to promote goodwill and it's to promote it through our principles our product our service and our people and you know what does that mean and the act of goodwill what does that mean um, first and foremost, I think it's about really the act of doing good and treating others the way you want to be treated, the golden rule. Our mission's never changed. I will tell you, when we sold to McDonald's, uh, I remember my dad saying, this is awesome. Now we have an opportunity to really work with the world's largest restaurant company and show that you can be a principal-centered <coughs> company and make a profit. Like, this is awesome. 
And that, that's been our mission since I was a little girl and our company is to maintain at the core, keeping your principles and making a profit because profit is good and profit is healthy. You have to have profit. Even if you're a nonprofit, you should have profits. <laughs> There's no, no margin, no mission, as Margie always says, but you have to. And it's important because you want to be able to give back not only to the community, but to your people. And so it's an important part, but it's, uh, and that's about prosperity. And that's about having a healthy body, mind, spirit, and emotion. And so having healthy profits is prosperity. When you can bring your whole self to work and you can work in an environment that is profitable, um, that's, that's when you really bring that sense of caring and trust. Donatos in Latin means to give a good thing. So you continually work to give a good thing even as you grow and, and touch more and more people. What's the recipe for that? How do you do that? I think you just do the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important, again, to be yourself. And so I'm so excited because in our transition and with Tom Krause leading the company, I've been able to do more of that and get out into the community. And my most recent favorite, oh, there you are, Tani. Favorite project is, is working alongside with Tani Crane, who is my mentor and my inspiration and Carrie Millard with Millard Consulting on the South Side Project, um, our Reeb Avenue Center, which has been truly a labor of love, um, which I'll tell you all about if you'd like to come do a tour, we'd be happy to tour. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's a, such an interesting thing. It's about giving your time and resources to things that you love mm -hmm. and what's important to you. And you know, South Side is very important to us. Columbus is very important to us. The, have, the pathway out of poverty is very important. And so how do we help do that? And so the Reeb Avenue Center is uh, really a center. It's a 110-year-old building. You can correct me, Carrie. The 110-year-old building um, that we're renovating, we raised $12.5 million last year. It's a private-public partnership. There will be 11 nonprofits in the building, and it's all under the educational theme of helping peoples. Um, and really, we have a state-of-the-art learning facility for zero through six. Boys and Girls Club will be on the third floor. Um, Community for All People, COIC, uh, Connect Ohio, uh, Goodwill, or Red Cross. And it's about anybody that enters that building. It's about education. So if I'm a single mom, I can drop my children off at the Learning Center or at the Boys and Girls Club. I can go get my GED in that same building. I can go get trained for a nurse's aide in that building. I can get trained on computers in that building. Um, and it's really about helping and giving back in the community so that we can lift that entire community. But I believe that's a national model. I really do believe that's a national model that we're going to take and learn from. So we'll be opening that. We're still in the process of raising an endowment, so if you would like to contribute to that. Um, our goal is $4 million. We have $718,000 raised in the endowment. And um, that's an important part for a sustainable right for a sustainable nonprofit and so that that's going to be an institution that'll be in that community for a long long time um, but we have to do it the right way you really uh, endorse the bloom where you're planted sort of concept uh, you, you, this is not a company that just um, you know acts in a vacuum you have tentacles and reach out everywhere uh, why is that so important to be uh, vested in the community where you were born well, first off, Columbus is an amazing community. I mean, yeah. I was at the Harmony Project last night, and that, in its essence, is, I think, the best example of Columbus. The diversity, people coming together, having a voice, and having a common cause. I mean, it's inspirational if you have not seen the Harmony Project. But that, in and of itself, is about people coming together because we're all better together than we are as individuals trying to do things on our own. And, you know, for us as a company, again, since I was a little girl, Dad used to yell at the delivery drivers when they squealed down the alley because they were being too loud because we lived in a <laughs> residential area. And so it's really that. just about being a good neighbor. Mm -hmm. Whether you live in your own neighborhood in your house, it's about being a good neighbor. Or, or if you're doing business, it's about being a good neighbor. And, and giving back is important. So. I don't know any other, uh, honestly, I don't know any other way. It's part of the fabric of the way we were brought up is being involved and giving back and not just 
money, but giving back of your time and your resources. And you want your employees to do that too. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And so every store has the opportunity yeah. um, where they can choose what they want to do, um, and they get to give back in the community as well. But you know, and I think it it really builds, especially the new to this millennial generation, which my son's sitting in the audience, which he is the millennial generation. Um, <laughs> so many times you read that, it's like, oh, that's all the millennials, want. you know, they want to work for a company that mm -hmm. gives back. If you're doing it just for that reason, I think it's the wrong reason, mm -hmm. because it's not authentic. I think you truly, you have to be doing it because it's the right thing to do. And anything you do as an organization, whenever, you're, if you're following a trend because it's where, where the consumer base is going, then it's probably not the right thing to do. It's about doing things that are true to who you are and what your core is and what your mission is. And then I think it builds energy. It, there's, there's a lot of connectivity that goes on when you're in the community and then you're learning from everybody um, and not just isolated in your own box. Got it. Not pizza box. <laughs> but a pizza <laughs> box is good. <laughs> All right, we have the questions that we want to collect uh, because we're just at about that time, questions from the audience. So if you can pass those in. And while I'm waiting for those, I do have a question about, um, you know, uh, one of the uh, quotes that resonated with me from a movie, Shakespeare in Love, um, was when the queen says, I know something about being a woman in a man's world. Have you ever felt that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. So, oh, I'm in the pizza business. I mean, it, and growing up in the pizza business. Um, but I think what I learned very m early, um, I started. I started in our human resource department after making pizzas and running stores and being in operations. And then our human resource department it was called human resources then. Um, what I realized, which was fortunate for me or not fortunate, I don't know, but we, I didn't know what human resources was. And so I, I was like, this is silly. We need to call it a people department because it's really about people. And it was about interviewing and making sure we're bringing the right people on board and making sure we're building the right culture so we have the right soul. Um, and in that, I started going to a lot of different networking business meetings where, um, you know, I was taught during the McDonald's days that you should dress a certain way, you should cut your hair, you should, mm -hmm. you need to start performing this way. And um, I, I remember a lot of people around me, but just saying, gosh, if you can't be yourself at work, like, mm -hmm. I don't, I, I think everybody should have the opportunity to be who they are at work. And their self-expression of who they are at work should be who they are. And it's not about, oh, I'm going to this, this meeting or this business function, I need to be this type of a person. Um, so I think femininity, I think um, being a woman adds a lot to the workplace as far as allowing people to um, really understand compassion. And you know, the four C's is character, courage, conviction, and compassion, and bringing compassion to work and love to work. And again, if you can be that person outside of work, bringing love into the workplace is critical. How important is confidence in the whole realm of things? Uh, that's an interesting. And does it come from all of those things? I think confidence comes from really the story that you tell yourself and the power of positive thinking and the people you surround yourself with. There's a fine line though because um, when confidence becomes arrogance and during the McDonald's days it did it, for me and then it became a shell of who I was. And you know, I'll never forget my dad saying to me right after we bought the company back. He's like, "Oh, you know, you can go as far as you want as long as you don't care who gets the credit." That's, he says that all the time. And he's like, "As long as you don't, just don't let your ego get in your way." And I'm like, Psh, "Dad, you don't have to worry about me letting my ego get in the way." <coughs> and then I went, "Well, if I have to say that, that's probably not a good <laughs> sign." <laughs> <laughs> so, I, for me, it is confidence is is truly learning to love yourself for who you are and not trying to be someone else and um, accepting your vulnerabilities and um, accepting yourself for who you are and really having the confidence to live yourself out loud. Right. Okay, so question number one from the audience and there's no name on this. So um, thank you for the question. Here it goes. What are the biggest challenges you are currently facing and any plans to develop a deep dish pizza? 
<laughs> I love that. <laughs> Biggest challenges we're currently facing, um, I'm looking to the team out here. Mm -hmm. I, I really truly believe that the biggest challenge you face in any company is making sure you attract and retain the right people. Um, the biggest learning that we've had is when you know that person's not the right person and you don't act fast enough to get that person out of your company and help them become an alumni, um, <laughs> <laughs> because that's the way to do or exit <laughs> with dignity and respect, because you, you do want to treat people with dignity and respect. but. Um, our biggest challenge is ensuring that we've got the right people in the company who, who are there because they love to serve others. And if, they're, if our managers aren't getting up every single day loving to serve others, then they're in the wrong business. doesn't make them bad people, but they're wrong business. But when you let that one person go too long in a company, it's like cancer, and it spreads. And that one person can make such a difference that they can be getting the results, but if their values and their principles are doing it the wrong way, and, and we have in the past, that I have in the past, let people go on too long. It affects your entire company and the soul of your company. So um, I think our biggest challenge is just, just continuing to hold ourselves accountable to making sure that we have the people in, in our restaurants and in our organization and at the leadership level, which I know we do, um, really loving what they do and serving others. All right. And yeah. deep dish pizza? Deep dish pizza, um, yes. I, I have to, I don't, that has not been on our, uh, our uh, timeline <laughs> as of yet. I'm looking at you, Tom. Um, so no, it has not been. We never say never. Um, so that's for sure. We never say never, so. I'm a thin crust girl, so I, I'm glad you do thin crust. Um, so what is the modern equivalent? We spoke about the living room and, and people being in your living room. What is the modern equivalent of the Grody family living room? Hmm. That is a good question. And that is from Jim Lane. Jim Lane, wave. Thanks, That's Jim. a great question. Sounds like a great place to go on a Friday. <laughs> 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 well, um, I would say it's, that's an interesting question. I hope that because we are 70% off premise and we bring it to your home, I hope it's your homes. I hope it's where we're delivering pizza. I hope it's, um, I hope it's at Commerce. I hope. I hope wherever we're bringing our pizza, we're bringing people together with that type of love um, because that's what we're all about. It is, it is the experience that people get around pizza because you share it. And so that's the experience that everybody should get. I think the other part of that is social media yeah. becomes an experience for everybody. And um, I think that's an important element to the business as well. How has it changed your business? Oh, golly, it's awesome. I love technology. So <laughs> I think it's changed our business uh, dramatically. We, we have uh, Mobile Phone Act. We have online. Online, uh, honestly, the best thing we can do for our restaurant managers is take the complexity out of the restaurant for them so that they can be face-to-face -face with our customers. And so online is, has grown to about 30% of our business, which means less time answering the phones when we answer really fast, like, thank you for going to the other speech. Blah, blah. <laughs> Um, and you're like, what did you just say? <laughs> We're still working on that. Um, to order online. But ordering online allows really our managers to focus on making the product and taking care of our customers. What time, Jen? Okay. I just was getting a time check because my watch is broken. So. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not. Um, okay. Um, this is a funny one, and it's because y you're – very much the face of Donato's. You're out there on commercials, and so people are going to ask questions. <laughs> Stephanie Osman wants to know, and Stephanie, wave. Where are you, Stephanie? There you go. Where do you get your hair done? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I love you. I, <laughs> I go to someone I went to high school with at Salon Loss on Crossroads oh in 23. And you know, it's the, it's, I can't ever fire her, but thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> don't, you, don't you love that? Uh, okay, this is another uh, nameless question. Other than Donato's, what is the best pizza you've ever had outside of Columbus and in town? 
<laughs> I haven't. <laughs> okay. Well, this is just a recent example. We had opportunity to go to New York um, mm -hmm. the day after Thanksgiving. We were crazy, but which is awesome. <laughs> and I will say, I had Ray's Pizza in New York, and I, I, do I have to say it's the best pizza I had outside of Donatos? But it was pretty it was good. good. It was okay. Good. And what made it good? The people I was surrounded by, my fiance mm -hmm. and my family. So my the kids. experience of it the all. The experience of it all. All right. I have to ask just from what's your favorite pizza? Your your favorite type of Donato's pizza? Like for me, I like plain cheese. What do you like? Oh, good. Okay, because yeah. I like pepperoni. I I can eat a whole large pepperoni. And a so whole <laughs> large pepperoni. Where do you put it? I. I <laughs> I, Where do you I, put I, it? I, well, I put it in my, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but, I know it's boring, but I really love a large pepperoni. And I, it's just my favorite. Now, our new double bacon avocado is pretty darn good. We've got some new ones coming out. Um, so every time I have like a new, new favorite, but I always go back to the pepperoni. And how do you brainstorm those new ideas? Who's part of that? Uh, Tom leads that. We have a chef on board. We had two chefs and the entire team. We have Donna, who's worked with us for 45 years, um, and a team of people. They really come up with the ideas, and it is about understanding the trends of taste, um, and then they come up with lots of different ideas. So we get to eat a lot of different pizza. What's the biggest compliment that Donato's has gotten in your mind? The biggest compliment Donato's has gotten? Um, and what, what still makes you smile when you hear something from a customer? I had a great experience with your store. And that's not just the pizza. So it, I would say it used to be, it's like, was the pizza good? Was the pizza good? And now it's, oh my gosh, I had Joe deliver that pizza the other night and he was so friendly. Um, those, are, those are the best, I think, examples of delivering on our promise every single day when people had a good experience and, and the experience is larger than that person coming to the door. But that's the best compliment I think we can get. Two more questions, I promise I'm almost done. Undercover Boss, what did it teach you? <laughs> How many saw Undercover Boss here? I loved it. It taught me that sometimes our delivery drivers stop and smoke pot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was bad. <laughs> <laughs> so that was awful. So it was the middle of that week, and I will yeah. talk forever, but I won't. And um, so I'm on this delivery with this kid who's awesome. Like, I just wanted to clone him. He's, he's making me run up to the door, and he's timing me. And he's just this, <laughs> I'm like, who is this kid? He's awesome. He just lost 60 pounds. I didn't know it was because he was smoking pot, but <laughs> just lost 60 pounds. He's just telling me he's eating kale, sh you know, drinking kale shakes, all this stuff that he's doing. I'm like, this kid's awesome. Like, I'm thinking already, okay, what are we going to do at the end of the show for this kid? He wants to start his own business. How are we going to help? And, and then we're at this house and the last delivery of the night and it's midnight and, and he tells me, decides to tell me on national TV that <laughs> <laughs> it would be a really good idea to tell me. I had no clue um, that he sometimes, when he goes to customers' houses and they, uh, they ask him to come in and you know, I don't even know what he said because I blocked it out, hit a Mary Jane or something. <laughs> that he does it with him. And I thought I was going to die. I, I, I had to stay in a hotel room and when I was in Columbus filming and I, I just went back to the hotel room that night. It's three in the morning, I'm sick to my stomach. And I'm like, Dad, <laughs> I don't know how this is gonna air. <laughs> but unfortunately, we just had a guy tell us on national TV that he's smoking pot. So that was, it was yeah. scary. It was scary. I, I have to tell you, we handled it the way we would handle it. And, um, my mom has brought a lot into our business. My mom is one of the founding um, mothers of Amethyst, mm -hmm. which is a home um, for women to go after they've been incarcerated. So she's been involved with Amethyst for many, many years. And so we're all about second chances. Our company always has been. Never had a delivery driver tell me on national TV he was smoking pot before, so I wasn't quite sure how to handle that. Um, but I just went back to doing what we would do, and that's how we ended up handling it. So if you haven't seen it, we fired him. And then I rehired him if he passed a drug test. So he's, I get crazy mail about it, but 
Um, he's past six. He's working with us still. He's a great kid. He's back in school and he's doing wonderful. So. Wow. Last question. What one piece of advice would you give somebody going into business? Uh, you know, one of those millennials who's coming into the fold. What, what is that one thing? Coming that, into a family business? Coming into a family business, yeah. I would say do it because you love it. And um, I think a lot of generational businesses fall into it, and truly maybe some of our own family, because there's such a love for the business and it's all that it really becomes your family. Um, it's what you talk about at Thanksgiving and Christmas and birthdays and um, that sometimes it's hard to separate yourself and, and really have your own identity and what you really want to do. And I say that here, I'm in the family business, but I did have to check myself when we bought the company back to say, am I doing this because I want to make my dad proud? Am I doing it because there's a different role for me? Or am I doing it because I really truly love this? And um, all my siblings during that time had gone off and found their true passion. And I think it's hard to do in a family business, but I, I would encourage the person to make sure they, they dig deep in their soul and make sure that they find out what it is they love doing, because you're only going to be successful doing what you love. For example, my son owns and operates five snap fitness gyms, got, and he loves it, and he's very successful at it. And the, and to create an expectation that families should come into the business um, can create false expectations for the family and the business, right? Because yeah. that's not healthy. Uh, and so I think it's just, I think that's important. And then allowing your family at business to be a family at business. And I believe our Donato's family is truly, it's an extension of family, but it's a family at business. Mm -hmm. Jane, thanks for a great conversation. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> And we are not done quite yet. We would like to welcome Mary Yost, the editor of Columbus CEO Magazine, to the podium. Mary. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you, Jane. Did she make a great cover or what? <laughs> On behalf of the Columbus Chamber and Columbus CEO and the entire Dispatch Media Group. I'd like to thank, uh, thank you, Jane, for being such a great inspiration to us this morning. This has been a wonderful way to start the day, and we are so happy that, that we were able to have you be part of our CEO of the Year awards that were just awarded a couple weeks ago. And you can read more in our uh, Dis December issue about that. And I also want to make sure that uh, everybody is aware of some upcoming events for the Columbus Chamber. On December 9th uh, will be the Meet the Class event. This is a biannual event, and it's hosted with Morpsey and the Mid-Ohio Development Exchange, and more than 200 people are already registered. This is a chance to uh, see many of our incumbent and new state and local officials. So please check that out. And then I hope you're also planning to be part of the annual meeting. It's going to feature um, J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon this year. It's going to be as the keynote. And uh, this is going to be really neat, uh, just as Kristen adds so much as the interviewer in um, these events. Uh, Cardinal Health CEO George Barrett is going to be the interviewer for Jamie Dimon. And George Barrett is another one of our former CEO of the Year uh, winners. So uh, special pricing for the annual meeting is available until December 31st. You can uh, get all of this information online at the Columbus.org annual meeting. So we're going to be there. We hope that you will be there as well. And um, please look for more upcoming announcements about future CEO Insights events in your email inbox. And thank you for being here this morning, and please have a great day, have great holidays.